I'm Mark Sanders, and um, I'm sort of outing myself today as an inventor. I was actually originally a, a, an engineer and designer, but uh, inventor sort of fits a bit better. Anyway, um, I think the word inventor in the UK has a bit of a bad rap, um, especially with the media. There's a sort of a word association that inventor is math. And um, it, it goes as far as even our most, uh, some of our best inventors are derided in the media. You know, Clive Sinclair, he's actually remembered for things like his C5, one of his, his, his fail, failures. But he's, he's kind of forgotten that he was the guy that introduced the first affordable calculator and the first affordable computer. Anyway, my definition of an inventor, I think, would apply to many people in this audience, uh, engineers and designers. And I, I think inventing is about creating new 3D work that generates IP in some form. And my favorite image of inventing is, is actually Tony Stark from uh, the, the first presentation we saw. Um, this is the inventor behind uh, Iron Man, and uh, I don't know if you've seen this film, but the, the CAD system this guy uses is absolutely second to none. It's phenomenal. So, um, this is what I think a, a checklist should be for a real inventor. You're probably an engineer or a designer. You probably like making ideas real rather than just going for ideas. The number of times people come up to me and say, ah, you're a designer, I've got this idea, I'll share it with you 50-50, if only you'll just make it, engineer it, design it, get it into production. Huh? It just doesn't add up. Um, an inventor is someone who probably has many inventions, some of them failures. Um, I think that's probably the definition of experience, the fact that you've gone through failures as well as successes. Um, you probably don't work in a coal shed, but you probably work in a nice office with a really, really good CAD system. And you don't necessarily have to have white fuzzy hair and speak with a German accent. And uh, apologies to Dr. Diesel at the back. Anyway, um, we all tend to take, test, make, learn and repeat. And I'm actually driven by creativity and making the world a better place rather than making money. It, it started for me um, as a very young child being taken round steel factories in my home place, Sheffield. My granddad worked in a steel factory and um, being this far away from that melting steel had a huge influence on me. I mean, health and safety in those days just did not exist. And who says machines don't have personalities? I mean, the, these sort of pictures used to intrigue me as a youngster. Uh, I imagine them as, as real. And the future, it just seemed, oh, I couldn't wait for it. it. It was so exciting. So, the fascination of this and mechanisms and elegant structures drove me on to actually become an engineer. And my first stint was with a very small division of Rolls-Royce, making diesels, turbines, and things like that. Um, and then on to the, the mighty Mars Corporation on vending machines. Um, but I still crave something else, something a bit more human, something a bit more creative. And so, at, uh, I thought it was a mature age of about 26, went back to college. This is Imperial College, and it runs a fantastic joint course with the Royal College of Art. And I call that School for Inventors, because it's such a mix of different disciplines, all under one roof. It's a, it's a real melting pot of new ideas and new products. Anyway, initially, um, after the college, I started my own business, and it was a business to combine mechanisms, structures, and aesthetics. And I guess, like many of you engineers and designers in here today, um, 
I did a lot of inventing for clients and inventing for my, my businesses. And what I find is products are uh, somewhere on this mix between aesthetics and engineering. And most of the interesting consumer products are somewhere in the middle. Things that are actually, you know, you choose them because you love them and they, they fit into your life. And yet they also work really well. But engineers and aesthetic people tend to work separately. And I think that's wrong because it's, it's all design. Anyway, um, fantastic life being an inventor, I have to say. And uh, I was set up after the college to basically just do my own stuff. Um, you get to engineer, design, test stuff. Um, and I'm particularly interested in human transport, as you can see here. This is a rideable test rig of a, of a bike with hub centre steering. And uh, the aim was to make a bike even simpler than it could possibly be. Basically, two tubes. And, and some wheels. And this was actually carried up on um, a really super little program uh, called Swivel 3D. This was quite a long time ago, <laughs> in about uh, 1989. But it, it, it taught me that the tools that CAD offers are so exciting and so useful as a designer. And this product was actually for a famous inventor. Here's a Clive riding a, a prototype. And personal transport still fascinates me in all its forms. Um, this is a, uh, uh, an interesting look at what scooters could be like. Along with accessories for products, for bicycles in this case, uh, an old plastic gear that weighs virtually nothing uh, but uh, allows uh, very low cost and efficient use. Um, Golf carts have always been a fascination because they are folding structures and some of them have to carry about 600 times their own weight. So they're, they're interesting structures as well. And uh, kitchen tools have always been a really good fascination for me simply because they have the potential of improving so many lives. Everybody cooks and makes things in the kitchen. And so if you can speed up that task, it, it's, it's a real benefit. Um, the target is, for products like this, a combination of innovation and appeal. And I actually love the term um, which has equal meaning for both engineers and designers. And that term is elegance. Um, Anyway, from kitchen products, um, a few medical products. Um, this is a, a combination of a wheelchair and an operating table. Through to industrial products, which aim to uh, use minimum number of parts and save a lot of money in production. And um, I'm so grateful for some of these fantastic CAD tools. Um, I mean, for example, this is um, CFD, and although it's an engineering program, I, I think this is really, really beautiful, as well as being fascinating. But, and this is where the but comes in for probably why many people aren't engineers, the main reason it took me so long to come out of the closet as a full-time inventor was that um, none of the above products you just see are currently in production or, ge or generating royalties. They may be in production in the future, I hope, but um, they're not actually generating royalties. Some have actually been killed by low sales or by lack of funding or, annoyingly, by fakes, generally from the Far East. So, that um, wants me to ask, do you still want to be a inventor? And for me, the answer was always yes, yes. Um, so, bicycles, they've all really fascinated me. And although people think bicycles were invented 100 years ago, there's still a huge amount of innovation that uh, they can bring to the world. 
I think of them as like the perfect human amplifiers. For the same energy as walking, they actually take you um, four times faster and four times the distance. I mean, what's not to like about them? The snag is, though, that um, people just don't get them as an everyday life, lifestyle choice. Um, I'd love UK to be a bit more like Holland, where bicycles are used as a matter of course. But I think it's probably as much about image as it is about product. And also the road structure and bike lanes and things like that. This is a sort of graphic showing the amount of people using bikes. It's actually from the US, but it would count in many Western nations. And what the traditional bike industry tends to concentrate on is the 20% of real hardcore enthusiasts. They're the sort of red ocean of, um, of businesses fighting over the same customers. And what they tend to miss is this whole blue ocean of non-cyclists and non-users, people who could potentially be cyclists, people who maybe now just spend the whole time in a car. Now, my products tend to target mainly those what I call blue ocean users. Um, of course, it's fun to do some of the faster bikes as well, but uh, the main focus is the, is the blue ocean customers. And, and here's an example of, of the people I like to attract. Um, it's it's uh, gender independent. There's many women, there's men doing it. They're not sporty young guys. They're old people, young people, all different shapes and sizes. Um, this is actually Strider, uh, one of my first products. Um, and it's very popular in the Far East. Um, as far as folding bikes are concerned, they are a really useful invention because they bridge that gap between full cycling and using other forms of transport. You can take a folding bike with you onto the train, in your car boot. Um, but often, one thing that's ignored is that when the bike's folded, you have to move it around. And so, um, it's pretty obvious that to make them easy to use, having them roll is really important. And so, this roll when folded um, capability is, is something that I'm, I'm very keen on. Now, I'd like to introduce you, in true Tomorrow's World style, to um, my first folding bike, which is the Strider bike. And this is basically three tubes and three joints, which um, come together to form a sort of walking stick. So you don't actually carry it, you wheel it along. So if we're going down corridors and trains and things like that, it's ideal. And then it converts into a triangle, which Although it looks unusual because people aren't used to seeing a triangle with someone sitting on it, when you sit on it, all the contact points are in actually the right places. And um, it's, trust me, I'm, a, I'm an inventor, I'll show you. It does actually work and uh, it's great for getting around cities. Um, it folds back up into a sort of walking stick, like that, and then wheel it along. Now, I'd like to show you a little bit how this came about. Back to the slides. This was actually my final year project at the uh, Royal College, and um, it was inspired by the original McLaren baby buggy. Um, this was something that folded up and was portable, but instead of going as small as possible in every dimension, the designer said, well, why not make it long and thin, like a walking stick, and have the wheels it uses anyway at the end, so you wheel it along. That was the perfect inspiration for me for a folding bike. So the next thing were hundreds and hundreds of sketches, exploring brain dumps of, sort of like brainstorming with a sketch pad. And I picked this one out from on your right as the, um, the first sketch in retrospect of what became the, the triangle. It followed with lots of engineering calculations. Um, you know, there's no point in having an idea if you can't make it work. And that does need engineering. And it was the, such early days of CAD, it was faster to make 3D wire models, which is still a very useful way of, of sketch modeling. 
adjustable test rigs were also really important to get the feel of it and um, as many prototypes as, as it's possible to make. And this shows, the, the picture on the right shows the three tubes of a, of a Strider compared with the 11 tubes of a regular bike sitting behind it. Um, this is the sort of Mark 1, which came out many years ago, and it's now into Mark 5 uh, version with lots of additional things like disc brakes and um, things like that. But it's basically the same concept. Um, it's just been engineered and quality controlled, so it's a, it's a lot more reliable and fits more people. And in fact, it, it sells pretty well, um, especially in the Far East. There are other complexities in the UK which uh, tend to outsell it here. But um, one of the interesting things is, although the official production line make uh, about 20,000 of these a year um, in Taiwan, there are about three or four other factories that make fakes, and they make about 50,000 a year, which is a little bit annoying, except um, that the majority of those are actually sold locally into China. <laughs> and so it, it's sort of, it's kind of a compliment in a way. Anyway, um, I would say that the factories that make these are sort of Chinese state sponsored factories, which I think is a little bit annoying. But anyway, um, another product. This is um, a kitchen product. It's basically, you know when you chop food, then you come to put it in the pan, and you sort of miss the pan. This product gets around that by being flat to chop on and a chute to pour into the pan. Um, and it, it came around with, with that problem in mind. Um, starting off with lots of hand sketches and the, the core sort of engineering um, invention, if you like, is the fact that when you have two hinges crossing each other, only ever can one fl hinge flex at a time. So it gives this sort of uh, snap action between cutting board and chute. And um, lots of carnivals to test this, because it's flat, it's very easy to make a, a model out of, 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 of cardboard um, and again really early use of cat. I was such a fan of cat um, even in, in its early days um, I, I used it all the time um, and what happened was although the product was great I couldn't find anybody to make it um, I found people that wanted to market it but all the molders I approached um, said no six hinges on a piece of polypropylene it, it's just not going to fill them up but one of them said well hang on we've we've got this really interesting piece of software um, it's called mold flow um, and we'll use this as a test sample to see if we can simulate flowing across all those six hinges and they ran this and it proved to them enough that it would work and so they took a punt on, on the product, they shared the tooling cost with me, and, and the product went into production. And it's actually been in production ever since, and that's getting on for you know, over 20 years. It's, it still sells around the world uh, through a very innovative company called Joseph Joseph. Anyway, while we're on kitchen products, let's, um, let's talk about uh, one of the, the most popular kitchen products we have. The tin can. Now, the tin can was invented in 1810 to preserve food. Fabulous invention. It meant that food could be kept for months and months and months without it going off. The only snag was the tin can was invented in 1855, 45 years later. So, there was quite a wait before you could actually get into these tin cans. And, and in those days, they used to use a, literally a hammer and chisel to open a, a tin can. The next case study is this one-touch can opener, and it's a, basically a fully automatic can opener. You basically press the little button on top, and it walks around the can and opens it, and then stops automatically. So you can be doing other things as it walks around. 
And it was for, it, the target market was for the increasingly large demographic of elderly and infirm people who find opening cans a real pain. And we, we did a lot of research and lots of tests on these sort of people and found all they wanted was something incredibly simple, one button, one touch. And so the, the challenge for me was to um, try and create that mechanism from scratch. And like all these things, it started off with a lot of sketching, you know, how to get the, the, the basic cutting action plus the core um, gearing mechanism. And I tend to combine CAD with sketching, you know, do a quick printout and then sketch over the top of it um, as, a, as a, a quick way of moving forward. And this helped me develop the, uh, the first test rig, which was, was really to test the core mechanism, which is um, three plastic mouldings, uh, which sort of mesh together and do the whole automatic cut cutting operation. The rest of it is really a, a gearbox, a very deep gearbox and a low cost motor. Because the, probably the biggest challenge of this whole project was that, um, it had to cost, the cost of manufacture had to be a total of two pounds, um, which was quite a challenge. Um, but it, uh, it got there. And um, these, these things sell around the world. In fact, in the first year of production, um, they sold 40 million. So I think it went to an audience a bit wider than the target audience of, of elderly people and infirm people. Everybody seems to, to like them. This is the latest generation, which is more like a, a sort of like computer mouse that you plonk on a, on a can. So that worked well, and so the market company was pretty chuffed with it. They said, okay, right, um, that was pretty easy. Uh, how about a new challenge? How about we do exactly the same thing, but for jar lids? And so you put something on a jar, Press a button, walk away, and it does everything. It opens a jar for you. Now, in words, it sounds so simple, but when you think about it from a mechanical and an ergonomic point of view, it's a pretty tough ask. Because, first of all, you imagine opening a jar. Your, your fingers sort of adjust automatically so they don't slip at the same time as you twist in opposite directions. Now, my challenge was to try and make a mechanism that sort of simulated that human action. Um, again, to run, to open 50 jars on two AA batteries, or two rechargeables, with one touch. Um, and that was quite a tough challenge. The, the eureka moment, which didn't come like that, but came after a lot of sketching and a lot of research, was basically to use a, one of the weird factors of an epicyclic gearbox, that it can be used as a differential to share load. That combined with a pair of racks gives that very action we're looking for. And so to take you through this project, um, it, it started off with lots of sketches, how the mechanisms would work, how the, the shape and the mechanisms fitted together, because this has to have sort of um, shelf appeal, and it has to look friendly rather than some sort of um, robotic mechanism. Um, and this is a typical sketch where it got CAD printout and then loads of drawing on top of it. How could we tweak it and shape it to, to, to make it work better? And of course, the, the test rig. The test rig is essential when there's a new mechanism involved. You've got to prove that it works or it's a non-starter. It's more, mecha I suppose, uh, mechatronics than electronics because electronics are damn expensive. And remember, the total budget for all this was two quid, or three US dollars. And so instead of having electronic timing mechanisms, it uses things like you know, traditional cams and springs and um, switches. Uh, rapid prototyping, um, really important to make what I call a looks like, works like prototype something that you could give to someone and they can try it as if it's the real thing. And uh, rapid prototype is great for getting the parts, whether it's CNC or SLS or whatever. 
<laughs> the hard part, though, is assembling them all, all these little bits together, and actually getting to, them to work for the first time. You know, got, this is the first time it's ever gone together, and uh, up until then, it's been a sort of virtual design on your CAD system. Um, but anyway, it did all get together, and it was all made for two pounds, and it sells in the shop for between 12 and 20 pounds. So there's a, you know, a reasonable markup for all the little beaks in the trough in between. Um, okay. Um, I'm still absolutely fascinated by bicycles. And having worked on the small wheel variety, um, I thought, well, that's been really done to death, and lots of small wheel forming bikes. But if you look around any city, um, people that use bikes tend to choose, at least 90% of them tend to choose large wheel bikes. So there was a challenge here to make a large wheel bike that could fold as small as a small wheel bike and at least be as convenient as a small wheel bike. That's what this product is. And in true Tomorrow's World stuff, I'll show you how it works. As you can see, full-size bike, full-size wheels, um, all enclosed chain so that you don't get oil on your trousers and things like that. And it uses a 3D four-bar link inside here to basically bring the wheels together. So you can then wheel it along as a sort of wheel stick. You can make it smaller by putting things into the, the frame so it, it gradually gets smaller. And the key thing is this, this fast fold so that it converts between the two modes. And I'll try not to slide off the stage, but it, it does actually work pretty well. And there is a real benefit of the, of the large wheels. So this is the sort of rationale behind that. Um, large wheels are almost carryable at a handle and there's become a, a wheel pair of, of um, a wheel with a handle. Again, lots of sketches, a few calcs, um, lots of CAD models in this, this case, because designing a 3D four bar link that does all that in one action was pretty tough. And um, the CAD was the main tool in this, but I still like to back things up with, with other models. And this is, this is handmade models. Um, and apart from the CAD, calculations, sketching over the CAD, uh, wooden models, and finally CNCing up all the components to make a, again, a 3D four bar link, which is at the heart of it. Um, and what I call, again, a looks like, works like prototype. Because as an inventor, You've got to, apart from just coming up with these products, you've got to show them to potential investors, to potential marketeers. And so it's no good having something that looks like a breadboard and asking them with a leap of imagination to imagine what it'd be like in production. And likewise, if you show them a wooden model of a bicycle and they try and get on it and it breaks, it's sort of like, huh? what, where's the engineering? So a looks like, works like prototype is essential. And that's what this is. The thing, about, the thing that CAD can't do is, is generate the feeling of testing, you know, what it's actually like to ride a bike, the, the, the feedback from the steering and things like that, and actually the fun of it. Um, this bike is now in production with Pacific. It's recently been launched in the UK, uh, having been uh, sold in the Far East, where these sort of things are much more popular. Um, but it's a very expensive bike, it's, it's a custom made bike and, and the feedback was could we apply something similar to traditional bicycles and so that's what this is, it's, it's taking the core 3D 4 bar link and putting it into a conventional frame um, and so you have all the benefits plus 100 years of development of things like gears and wheels and tools to use. Uh, and this falls down into, again, a wheel stick with, with the high-performance 700C wheels. Again, testing. It's, it's the best part of this job, it really is. 
um, from testing downhill to you know, taking these products into places where they shouldn't be, like cafes and suitcases and on aeroplanes. Um, this is the product as it is in production, and it's, uh, it's a pretty fast bike for a bike that folds down into um, a small package. Anyway, um, I'd like to round up with just a few tips in, in case um, any of you here really want to go the route of, of, of being a, a, an inventor. Um, basically, I, 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 the first tip is obviously discuss with your employer that you can invent outside, your core, uh, outside their core business, because there's nothing worse than coming up with an idea and then the business saying, no, 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 we can't do that because it belongs to us. Uh, and then discuss um, royalties and fees. If you're a consultant, one really useful route is to suggest that you take a combination of royalties and fees. And you could argue, if you are really you know, putting your money or your time where your mouth is, if this product's going to be as successful as, as a consultant you claim it's going to be, you should demonstrate that and share the risk. Um, it is a risk though, because as, as you've seen before, many of these products um, just don't make it to market. Ask the marketing folk what a killer product is for them. They're the people that meet customers all the time. I sometimes think some designers are a bit arrogant and say, no, 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 we know best, we'll tell you what your customer needs. No, they spend, you know, the, they know the market, so ask them what the killer product is, and then try and improve it, make it even better. Dream. That's, that's probably the funniest and most useful attribute. Um, and then make those dreams real. Prototype, test, build. Keep a constant radar out for what needs improving. What products just don't work? What could be improved with new modern materials and processes? that existed years ago, but can be improved now. Um, I'm very skeptical about patents, personally. I've got lots of them, but um, I think their real value is for CFOs, Dragon's Den, and bragging. If companies like Apple, with their patents, can't make them stick in places like China, what chance do you know, small companies like you and I have Anyway, we all go on that. Uh, trademark copyright design registration is actually almost as good. Um, in fact, you can call a design registration in the US, it's called a patent, so you can say it's patented. And pe search patents online are incredibly useful for actually helping with the design process. They're actually a really creative way of seeing lots of alternative concepts that you may not have even thought of. And finally, be tenacious, just stick at it. But you have to keep in line, and you have to know when a product is just not going to happen. That's the time to walk away and move on to something else. Anyway, that's time that I ought to walk away and move on to something else. I've been Mark Sanders. My Twitter account is very easy. It's at 77A, which happens to be my address. And uh, thank you for your attention. And thank you guys at the back for all your fantastic cad tools.